good, good evening all. I'd like to um, welcome you to our third webinar in the series that sits around the climate responsive retrofit, our interdisciplinary university design challenge 2023. And tonight we're looking at the AECB um, standard. The huge challenge, retrofit is essential, it's not easy. It's far more challenging than new builds and it takes a team of knowledgeable, caring professionals to accomplish schemes that work. And we need our future professionals to understand the complexity and embrace the constraints and challenges. So Timber Development UK are working in partnership with the, the Association for Envi Environment Conscious Building, um, the Built Environment, Smarter Transformation, the New Model Institute of Technology and Engineering, Edinburgh Napier University and the Passive House Trust, all who have deep knowledge on retrofit. And we are, have software support from Trimble, the Passive House Institute and the AECB via the Carbon Tool. So the TD Challenge 23, we're asking interdisciplinary use university teams to form to design, engineer and cost a retrofit scheme for an existing timber frame building that requires a second life. It's the old cricket pavilion in Hereford. And you can find all the information that you'll need on the Timber Development UK website under the design challenges. So with that, I'd like to um, introduce our speakers. So Trish Andrews is the training manager from the AECB. But our speakers tonight are Andy Simmons, the CEO of the AECB, and Gervais Manguana from Waxwing Energy. So, gentlemen, with that, I'd like to stop sharing. Uh, I'll apologise for the, uh, the, the long AECB name. That trips most people up. Um, we have been environment conscious builders and designers since 1989 when we, when we set up. So I'm going to uh, talk first, um, then Gervais is going to go through a bit of a case study uh, and then I'll sort of wrap up and pick up any uh, questions that we're pulling out of the Q&A that we think are warrant maybe a bit of sort of a discussion at the end of, of this session. Meanwhile, if you, any students want to put questions in the Q&A, feel free, please do that, uh, and we'll quietly answer those in the background. Okay, so I'm Andy Simmons, um, part-time architectural designer with Simmons Mills Architects and part-time uh, CEO of the ACB. So we set up in 1989. Um, broadly, you would describe the ACB as uh, a sort of microcosm of the building industry containing people from all different walks of life, whether they be uh, designers or manufacturers, um, local authorities, uh, tradespeople and so on. So it really has uh, people from all walks of life across the building industry and it, and it has contained and, and, and still does uh, leading pioneers uh, in the UK and further afield um, in, in, the, in the area of, of green building. So the ACB a few years ago developed some training courses which are now brought together under the ACB Carbon Light Training Centre. Carbon Light comes from Carbon Literate Design and Construction. Um, now the oldest course that we've got which is still popular is the Retrofit Foundation course, that's a non fully online course. Um, we have a Retrofit Coordination course which is currently not accredited to, to level five but uh, potentially soon will be. Um, and we have a uh, training in um, uh, um, energy modelling using the Passive House Planning Package, which is PHPP, which you'll see referred to regularly throughout this, this talk. So during this talk, what we're going to uh, concentrate on, or hope you're going to sort of pick up, is uh, a general overview of the ACB retrofit standards. There are now two of these, which we'll describe in a, in a minute. Hopefully you'll get a, a basic understanding of the methodology on which these standards are based and the criteria that define what the standards are. But we're going to enliven it a bit. Standards can be a bit dull. Um, so, but, but what's hit, uh, sitting behind them is a very important key principles uh, and how you deliver to these building performance with well, energy performance standards um, requires a, a, an understanding of the of the key of the key principles key design and construction principles so currently we've got five standards three of them uh, three of them are 
you're able to certify projects to them. Now, you'll be familiar with the concept of certification if you've uh, you read up about the, the Passive House standards. So that's the new bill Passive House standard and ENFIT, which is the um, uh, Passive House Institute standard for, for retrofit. Per, I actually live in, a, in the, in the uh, first UK certified ENFIT a house conversion in, in the UK, um, very comfortable it is too. So the methodology that underpins the ACB standards is exactly the same as that which under, underpins the, the passive house family of standards. So the first ACB standard is the new building standard, and that's based on a self-certification route for certification off our low energy buildings database system. Uh, the retrofit standards, which was once one retrofit, focusing on a deeper fabric retrofit, has now been broken into two stages. So we have the uh, level one retrofit standard and the level two retrofit standard. And I'll explain more about this as we go through forwards. We have a water efficiency standard, um, which is important and, 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 and had a role in changing the building regs a few years ago. Um, that is something that will increasingly uh, people will become much more focused on water efficiency uh, and that standard is there uh, for you to, to go and have a look at on the website. Uh, the lifetime carbon standard is um, really a, a fairly simple standard that encourages people to look for lower carbon uh, options in the way that they build. So this is more to do with materials and building construction rather than energy in use. Uh, and we have a daylighting standard just to uh, encourage people to uh, design for uh, for good good lighting in, in different sort of situations, different building types. It's always worth saying um, about energy models, any any sort of model, whether it's whole earth system models or or uh, energy models, that uh, all models are wrong, but some are useful, and we'll refer to this, uh, Gervais will, will probably refer to this as well as we go through, because there are a lot of figures in this presentation, a lot of graphs and a lot of figures. And what, what we'll be showing you is not sort of what we believe is a definitive uh, uh, sort of outcome, um, but it certainly models give us very good insight into how to design buildings, how buildings are performing and things we can do to, to improve their, their performance. So. In terms of the, the, the models we're talking about tonight, we're talking about PHPP, which is a passive house planning package. We're talking about, um, we're mentioning uh, the SketchUp plugin design PH, which was uh, developed by a similar team to that which developed passive house planning package. Um, we uh, are talking about PH ribbon, which ACB developed with uh, Tim Martell, and that's uh, embodied carbon modeling. And uh, we're also going to mention and show some results briefly from the ACB stock model, which is basically an Excel based uh, uh, model where we're doing top down and bottom up uh, modelling of the energy performance of English uh, and uh, Scottish and Welsh housing to try to understand the impact of the standards we're proposing at scale, if aggregated at scale over time in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. OK, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on on this graph. Now, this is a graph from a Letty publication, um, which we've sort of overlaid. So what this is showing is uh, the vertical axis. We have uh, numbers of, of dwellings in their millions. And along the uh, horizontal axis here, we have space heating demand. Now, that is the uh, the demand, the, the, the sort of um, the amount of energy needed per square meter each year. Uh, for houses of different types. So you can see that this sort of normal graph that you're seeing in front of you is made up of uh, different uh, house types, flats, mid terraces, semi-detached, detached and, and bungalows. And you can see that they, uh, they cluster around a uh, space heat demand of around about 130 or so um, kilowatt hours per square meter and year. So a 100 square meter house would be using 130 times 100 kilowatt hours in that year just to heat the space to a given temperature. Now, the cumulative effect of all this uh, energy use, 83% of which is, is gas in this, in this country, uh, is obviously emitting greenhouse gases and costing people a fair amount of money. And a lot of it is leaking out of those structures. Um, so what we need to do is shift this over to the left. 
and reduce the uh, average space heat demand across the whole stock uh, fairly significantly over a, a pretty short period of time. Now, clearly, early ambitions to do that rapidly. Had we started in the 1970s, we could have done a lot better. Um, <clears throat> we're losing our opportunities now. It remains a massive challenge in a, uh, an increasingly uh, hard challenge uh, because of the, the time and our diminishing uh, carbon budgets, if we're paying attention to that. So you can see that we've identified um, those standards which have a space heat demand. Um, so NFIT is, is, is a retrofit standard, as I said, which is sitting down at 25 kilowatt hours per square meter in year on the far left there. Uh, there is another way to certify to NFIT, which is where you um, use certified components, which allows you to do step-by-step -step type retrofits. Uh, that generally sort of produces uh, buildings, homes, uh, operating at about 35 kilowatt hours for the space heating. Uh, you can see the ACB level two standard, which is the deeper retrofit standard, um, sitting there at 50. Uh, and, and, and likewise, you can see typical new build there sitting at around 85. That's a typical new, an average new building uh, built under the current building regulations. Now, I'll explain this in a bit more detail, but the level one standard is not the same as these standards in the sense it doesn't have a space heat demand target. What it's doing is trying to get us off fossil fuels with a, a much lower capital cost. And it's using two things. It's using the fact that the electricity supply of the UK is decarbonizing, and it's using the uh, very simple and long known about technology of heat pumps uh, to um, basically scavenge heat from the outside air, whether it's water or ground or, or, or the air, um, and use a small amount of electricity to move that heat from outside to inside the home. So it's reducing the heat demand in a different way, as you'll hopefully pick up later on. So I'm going to go through a few of the sort of ways in which we are able to decarbonize housing but also just show some of the assumptions we do have to be a bit, of care, bit careful about, because when I mentioned that thing about modelling, all models are wrong, the assumptions that sit behind models can be very significant, mm -hmm. and really we should make clear what assumptions we are making. So let's look at the decarbonising electricity supply. This is in the context of moving buildings off gas towards electricity, mainly electricity. There are other ways to provide low carbon heat, but certainly the most obvious and um, at scale solution at the moment is, is, looks to be electricity. So the UK electricity grid is shown there on the right, and that shows you how many kilograms of CO2 for every kilowatt hour produced. Um, how, how, sorry, how much CO2 is being emitted per kilowatt hour of electricity generated? And you can see there are different scenarios there. You can also see in the, uh, the sort of gray line that um, that's actually historical data. So that's, that's measured data versus uh, a sort of predicted, um, predicted uh, reduction in carbon intensity. And it's something we should keep our eye on because uh, uh, you can see there's a discrepancy that the idealized uh, projections are better and more optimistic than the uh, measured. Now that should converge for various reasons I won't go into in time over time, that should become less of a discrepancy. You can also see that some scenarios have assumptions that we will be growing very large amounts of um, uh, bioenergy, uh, which is sequestering carbon and uh, burning it and capturing that carbon. Now this gets us into the area of um, carbon negative this and carbon negative that. Now, again, to cut a long story short, we don't consider these scenarios to be solid at all. So we tend to discount them, as in fact does uh, the government in the way that it adopts one of those scenarios, which are not carbon negative, is not carbon negative electricity. Um, so again, people do choose different scenarios to judge their carbon intensity of their, of their own energy use again. So we, we're looking for consistency and realism here. How fast do we retrofit? Now, this is the theme of this. Uh, the slides are ha is housing, but everything you're looking at here is applicable to um, to all buildings um, at this level. Anyway, so whereas before we used to be thinking about retrofit being a kind of uh, something you got on with 
uh, and just built and built and built and did more and more retrofit. What we're thinking now is that uh, um, it's more likely to be several waves of retrofit done to different depths. So what we're illustrating here is um, a mixture of uh, uh, an increasing rate of retrofit, some of which is looking at a lighter retrofit with heat pumps, and some of which is focused on deeper retrofits where you're reducing the energy use, in this case, uh, for space heating, um, uh, much more quickly. So um, there are reasons why, I'll just use the term level one. So level one is the light retrofit where you don't do much to the building, but you do add a heat pump. Um, and level two is where you may add a heat pump, but you don't have to remove your fossil fuel heating system, but you, you put a lot of work into the building fabric to reduce its need for, for, for space heating energy. Now you get uh, certain benefits from a uh, deeper retrofit, uh, many of which are not energy related. So it might be sort of they're quieter buildings, uh, healthier indoor air quality, um, they uh, help take people further away from fuel poverty, so they isolate you more from, from price shocks, which are, can be attractive, a lot of those things can be attractive, say, for housing associations. So there are very good reasons why uh, a deeper retrofit, even with the um, uh, higher capital cost, are st is still attractive. So there will be uh, two uh, different approaches to what is attractive at any one point in time. However, over time, uh, the uh, uh, the deeper retrofit may become actually more incentivized by government for good reasons. One example might be uh, that as the national grid uh, increases its uh, electricity, uh, low carbon electricity supply, and more people come off gas and onto electrical heating, that um, this becomes increasingly expensive or politically unpopular for all the transmission lines, uh, and actually the government wants to reduce the amount of uh, the, the peak heat, the, the, the need for peak heating energy in the winter, and they would actually start to incentivize deep retrofit in a way that they currently are not now. So again, this is thinking out over time what is attractive for different levels of intervention in buildings. And of course, what we're trying to do is we are trying to reduce the amount of CO2 emissions each year <clears throat> emitted by, by buildings. <coughs> Excuse me. Now we have tried to make an attempt to 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 quantify in this model. This is the ACB stock model, not just the greenhouse gas emissions being given out by the energy use for running the buildings, but also the amount of energy that goes into creating the materials for the retrofits. So you can see the the the, the sort of larger lines. Um, the, high, the, the sort of uh, um, top two lines there, that is to do with the space heating energy being used to heat the building. Whereas those lower lines, those are um, emissions associated with uh, construction materials and transport and so on that are um, incurred by, the, by manufacturing materials, um, extracting them from the ground, uh, moving them to the factories, uh, turning them into building products, taking them to site and so on. So you can see uh, on the right hand side, if you look at the graph on the right hand side, you can see that this is what the total, uh, the dotted line shows you the total CO2 emissions from heating buildings and also making the materials that go into retrofitting them. If you don't decarbonize the manufacturing of those materials over time, so you can see it's fairly significant and it does slow down the rate of reducing CO2 emissions from buildings. The graph on the left is making an assumption that over the next few decades, we are in fact decarbonizing the manufacturing processes as well. So again, you can see that is a big assumption, both as to the rate that we decarbonize manufacturing and also the political will to drive that uh, and industry responding by focusing on construction materials that, um, that are easier to decarbonize. So for example, you know, steel, cement, there are ways, there are ways that those industries can be uh, decarbonized, but will those paths be taken? We don't know, we have to make an assumption. And of course, I'm just putting this graph in really because it's the other way of looking at CO2 emissions from space heating. The previous graph showed um, emissions per year coming from the housing stock. 
And what this is showing is the amount of CO2 being put into the atmosphere each year. And that means that in a graph like this, what we're looking to do over the next few decades is to stop the steepness of that graph to bend the curve and bring it down. A horizontal line is what we're looking for. If the graph, if the line is sloping upwards, then we are still adding carbon to the atmosphere. So coming back again to um, embodied carbon. So there are different, so we won't go into this now, but there's, there's a good video on the ACB website if you want to understand about embodied carbon accounting. Um, but this, the, the, the stages A to C, the calculation stages A to C, um, which you could describe as um, uh, lifetime carbon, um, can be sort of analysed for any one particular building and expressed in terms of, on the right hand side there, uh, you can see the proportion of, of carbon emitted related by material. And then on the left, you can see uh, it related in terms of uh, what part of the building we're talking about. So external walls, roof, building services, substructure and so on. And you can get some very different results. For example, if you include the embodied carbon of photovoltaic panels in your calculations, then they can be surprisingly high and they can, they can vary uh, significantly between different manufacturers of those panels. For example, some of those panels might be being made uh, with hydroelectric power, as an example. On the right hand side there, you can see uh, the oil based um, building products account for a fair amount. Concrete, not surprisingly, um, this is for a, for a particular project. This is actually a retrofit project that's been analysed here. Um, you can see uh, timber there is uh, has uh, carbon emissions associated with it. Come on to that a little bit later, perhaps. And again, by doing these carbon accounting calculations, in this case using pH ribbon, it allows you to have a look at an early stage at different construction options for your choice of materials in, in any build, whether it's new build or, or retrofit. So the graph on the left is just three different uh, external wall insulation options, and that's a lifetime analysis looking at a, a notional 60 year lifetime for that external wall insulation. And uh, what you can see is that the carbon emissions are lowest for uh, the system that we use on this project, which was a uh, recycled newspaper cellulose insulation filled timber I-beam system, which was bolted over the face of the old house. We would have emitted more lifetime carbon had we used um, a sort of petrochemical based external wall insulation. However, there are some interesting features that happen at the end of a building's life because the accounting process has to account for what happens to those materials at the end of life. So there are assumptions built in there. There are standardized assumptions and there are assumptions that you could change. You could say, well, I don't want that to happen to those materials at the end of the life and therefore I'm going to use them. Um, but you'd have no control over that. This is in the future. So you can see that up kick at the end is where the accounting system that we've all agreed to um, uh, across Europe uh, and in the UK, um, that is the, the, the release of carbon at the end of its life through various purposes, either reasons, either it's incinerated or it's landfilled and slowly degrades releasing methane, for example. I'm just gonna skip over that, except just, just just, just to say that the the the, um, the first retrofit standard, the level one retrofit standard, um, has has fairly recently been developed because we realise that uh, if we're careful about doing a, a shallower retrofit, we and we don't lock out the possibilities of doing a deeper retrofit later, um, then it is a very meaningful thing to do, given the decarbonisation of the electricity grid and given uh, the the sort of exceptional efficiency of electric heat pumps. So what this what the level one standard is designed to do is to get us off fossil fuels. It's a simple, easy, I say simple, <laughs> is anything simple in this country? Um, it is a simple, easy and, and a relatively low capital cost way to reduce um, uh, carbon emissions. Um, now, some buildings, uh, it suits very well some buildings it's not appropriate for. And when you get into applying these standards, you can see that, and Gervais will talk about this a bit later on, um, 
uh, you can see that some buildings actually it's not that good a fit for a level one standard typically because you might end up actually having quite high running costs um, because the fabric is so is so poor or the shape of the building is is is, is, is so challenging so the level one standard is designed in a way where when you certify it to it, we, we do ask people to show us very clearly that they won't be blocking uh, future work, which might want to take uh, measures a bit further and further reduce uh, uh, energy demand and improve comfort further. Now, don't worry about this. This is this is a table with lots of small writing in it, but um, it's just useful to look at, uh, to understand what an energy performance standard is. So this is a level one. This is the ACB level one retrofit standard. And we have a, a column on the left, which is the criteria. Um, because it's a standard that people can certify to, we have a list of uh, um, evidence that we require people to uh, put up on the low energy buildings database to, to sort of substantiate their, their claims. So the column on the left, which we'll look at in a bit more detail now, um, uh, shows us what you have to achieve in uh, when applying this to, to, to a building. So what we're doing, as I said, is changing the, the heating system of the building, whether it's a dwelling or, or, or your project, away from fossil fuel uh, to, a, to a heat pump. Um, now, I'm going to compare and contrast the level one with the level two. So remember, level one is the lighter retrofit, where you don't do much work on the building fabric, but you put a heat pump on it. And then the level two is where you're really reducing the space heat demand much, much lower, and you're doing quite a lot of work on, the, on that building, which is probably more relevant to your, your current project. So, so criteria for level one, change the dwelling's heating system to a heat pump. Now with level, with, with level two standard, you don't have to go to a heat pump. Obviously, if, if it's a good opportunity to do so, you'd be foolish not to do it. But if you've just bought a new boiler, um, uh, then you can leave those existing fossil fuel heating systems in. You can't put, under the standard, you can't put a new fossil fuel heating system in, but you can leave the existing ones in. But we do require people to show how they're thinking ahead and have designed in uh, future proofing to allow low carbon heat to be uh, fitted in, in the future. Back to level one again. Um, so we do require forward planning. These things have to be planned out. Um, it doesn't have to be hugely detailed or expensive, but you do have to do the strategic thinking to uh, anticipate what can and should happen over the lifetime of that building, even though you're only doing some of the work that you might need to do that, that needs to be done on that building over its lifetime. So we do ask for a long term energy plan using PHPP. Gervais will clearly uh, show what that looks like. Uh, and that's the same for, for for level two, because it has to be planned, planned out. Um, Level, uh, level one again. So the heat pump heating system. Now it's critical that when these heat pumps go in, they are, the, the efficiency is maximized. You, you, you'll see it referred to as a, as a, as a, as a COP, a coefficient of performance or an efficiency. So if a um, coefficient of performance of a heat pump is, is quoted as, as say 2.5, that's 250% efficient, whereas a sort of good gas boiler might be only 90% efficient. It gives you a sense of the, of the sort of uh, effectiveness of, of heat pumps. Um, so what we've done is simplified the criteria down to uh, ask for um, uh, a return and flow temperature, which is low enough that allows the heat pump system to work very efficiently. It doesn't keep going on or off. It doesn't throw a load of heat into the building and then go off again. Um, that's a very inefficient way of, of heating systems working. So by having a low flow temperature, more constant operation, you can actually, um, uh, increase and improve the, the efficiency of, the, of, of these heat pumps, which is uh, which is precisely what you need. So we've set that temperature at 45. That's for the system designer to, to work to. Uh, air tightness is very important. Basically, again, we'll, we'll talk a bit about this. Uh, so we've set a, 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 what some people might say is a fairly relaxed air leakage. This is the, the sort of drafts um, coming into your building and carrying heat out and creating discomfort and so on. So we've set that at level one for five, but we expect level two standard to tighten that up to an air leakage of two. So um, a typical house could be anywhere from, well, could be anywhere from five up to uh, 15 uh, in terms of the, the, the meters cubed per meter squared hour uh, figure you're seeing, you're seeing there. In terms of ventilation, 
although we're doing not much work on a level one house, uh, you must, we, we, we do insist on, on ensuring good ventilation. And at the moment, we are only convinced of the evidence for to maintain good indoor air quality by putting in a mechanical ventilation with heat recovery or a centralized extract only system. Obviously, the mechanical extract ventilation system, the MEV, is a lot cheaper, a lot easier to incorporate into existing buildings. Uh, if the opportunity exists and the budget's there for the ventilation with heat recovery, that is a very comfortable uh, piece of kit to get in um, with very good air quality. But there are bigger issues, which maybe we'll touch on in, in some of the questions. You know, we do have to create resilient buildings. We do have to make sure that they are maintainable and that the supply chains are there to uh, service them over, over many years. So there's some sort of slightly bigger questions there about our uh, trust in how, how things are gonna hang together over the next few decades. Um, and then of course, we've got a clear criteria about overheating. We have to be very careful about uh, overheating, uh, whether you're doing much work to an existing house or whether you're adding a lot more insulation. Uh, and then you can see the last few columns on the right there for the deeper retrofit level two, uh, we do include a space heating demand for the level two. Um, we do want the thermal bridges to be accounted for. Uh, we do want a check to be done on surface condensation risk, which is the uh, uh, this FRSI factor you see down there of being less than 0.75. I won't go into the details of that, but that's, that's checking that the, the way that different elements come together, the, the, the walls and the floors, for example, um, aren't detailed in such a way as to create condensation risk. And we do ask that a much more thorough condition survey is, is undertaken on, on the project to make sure that the, uh, the, the, the potential risks of, of working on the building fabric um, aren't going to compromise the building in terms of uh, moisture and the, and the materials in the building in terms of moisture risk. And then the level two also gives some guidance on uh, as, as well as sort of understanding moisture risk making encouraging people to think about radon risk um we've mentioned overheating pay a bit of attention to to the context of, of floods um historic and and um uh, current and potentially the future obviously sort of combustibility of materials uh, heritage issues to do with uh, the significance of that of that building uh, and questions around occupancy how is the building used now how might it be used in terms of again this is one of those assumptions um building designs can sort of suffer uh, particularly housing retrofits where um, uh, the, the wrong assumption is made about numbers of people uh, using the, the, the space. And of course, in terms of using these energy models to, to sort of look at the effects of interventions, insulation or adding ventilation systems or heat pumps, changing your heating system, it has a knock-on effect uh, these different levels of intervention have a knock-on effect. One of them is good in the sense that um, uh, the, the, the more you improve your building, the more the internal temperature in winter creeps up, which is always uh, welcome for people's well-being and, and health. Um, but we, do, we don't have any criteria about uh, the, the running costs, but we do obviously expect the certifiers and the building designers to be keeping a close eye on um, making sure that the way they're designing the heating system and the, and the retrofit measures themselves don't result in a more expensive building than the fossil fuel system that they're moving away from. Okay, so a couple of slides here on uh, what does that look like? What, what is applying a level one uh, retrofit to a typical semi-detached house? The typical semi-detached house is a good example to use because um, it... Uh, it, it represents uh, a very large number of houses across across the UK. So uh, moving an existing house to a level one retrofit would look something like this. Uh, topping up the attic insulation to take the U value from 0.45 to 0.1. So that could be four, 400 millimeters of insulation. Um, we're assuming that the cavity is insulated already. If it isn't, it would have to be. Um, we're assuming that at some stage double glazed UPVC windows have been fitted. Again, if for some reason they're single glazed metal windows, they would have to be replaced. Um, but most houses have, have, have made these changes in the past. And a bit of tightening up of the, uh, of the air leakage of the house to, to get it down to this permeability of five. Um, and you put a heat pump on it. Um, you don't necessarily have to do anything on the floor. 
unless you uh, you've got a particularly leaky floor, you might have to get to go inside a little bit and have a look around at the skirting boards and do some some air tightness work there. So it's, you can see it's a relatively light retrofit. Now, if you were to do take uh, that existing house straight to a level two retrofit, you can get a sense of the additional measures needed. The attic insulation is is the same as the level one, um, but we're adding for the walls here. We're adding some external wall insulation on. Um, the windows would be replaced. They would be replaced at a level two, most likely, uh, to get a higher performance, quite possibly to triple glazing, but it depends on the, uh, the climate region, if it's down in uh, Cornwall, perhaps, or, or, or somewhere uh, warmer than Scotland, maybe, with a particular design, you might be able to get a very good performance double glazed unit replacement there to do that. Uh, and you'd be insulating the floor. So you can see some of those U values are much improved in a level two retrofit and the air tightness is, that's incorrect, that's meant to be two, not five. So in terms of numbers and, and the outputs of the energy model, what we've got here, we've got um, the, uh, the, the bar charts on the left, that represents the existing house, unimproved house. Bar charts in the middle, um, uh, represent um, a, a level one retrofit and the bar chart on the right is a level two. I've had to squidge that down because the axis changed because obviously you're reducing a space heat demand so much it, uh, it, it sort of suddenly jumped in size. So, so what you're looking at there, just look at the red, the red block under the gain section. So what, the, what, what PHPP reports is where the energy is lost through the different elements and what is, what is gained. So What's in the gained column is solar is, is, is energy gained in through the windows, um, uh, internal heat gains from, from people using the building or equipment uh, giving off heat, and of course the space heating system. The space heating system is the red block. So uh, a large input from the heating system on the existing house, level one, that's reduced slightly, and level two, uh, the space heating demand is, is brought right down. Now, go back to the level one house and you can see the space heat demand has been reduced. This is the point that you can then reduce the effect, effectively reduce the heating demand by putting a heat pump on because the heat pump is 300% efficient and it takes heat from the environment with a little bit of electricity. So if you have a 300% efficient heat pump, you can take the heat demand and divide it by three to give you show you the amount of heating energy, in this case, electricity you'll be using. And of course, with a level two retrofit, you would almost have to be putting heat pump on that. So you can see you're making much more dramatic reductions in space heat demand. I'm gonna speed up a little bit so I don't uh, uh, cramp Gervais's um, time available. Um, so again, this is whole life carbon, and this is looking at those interventions, the existing building, the uh, level one retrofit, the level two retrofit. And this is looking at what is the overall impact in terms of greenhouse gas emissions from the existing house, uh, from the level one and level two intervention. So the green line shows you what happens if you do nothing. And that what that means is that house continues to burn gas and continues to put out CO2 at a rapid rate. And obviously you're adding cumulatively to the atmosphere quite significantly with that house. You do a level two retrofit in year, let's say year five there, and you can see that you've changed the trajectory of that curve dramatically. Um, now you can see why that, uh, sorry, that's the blue line. The blue line is level one. And you can see that that is a meaningful intervention that has stopped the rate of, 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 of CO2 emissions. Uh, it hasn't stopped it, it's, it's, it's reduced it very dramatically through the use of the heat pump. Bear in mind that the heat pump probably will have to be replaced every 17 years or so. So um, every 17 years, you would most likely have to replace that heat pump to keep that, that, that performance going. The deeper retrofit, the level two, does overall increase uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, here we've said that we do that deeper retrofit in year 20, but it not very significantly. And because there are so many non-energy, what we call co-benefits of deeper retrofit that are worth investing in, 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 worth investing a bit of carbon in, uh, we feel that it's it's neither here nor there, really, because it's such a dramatic change from business as usual. This is just showing the work we've done just to understand the implications of reducing greenhouse gas emissions from space heating in, in, in heating climates like, like ours, because if we are, in our minds, thinking about reducing 
emissions from buildings to to to, to allow to, to 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 satisfy the carbon budgets that we're we're not supposed to be breaking, uh, but also to create some space for all the other carbon emissions we want to do with our transport and food and so on. Um, we just thought it'd be interesting to set how much uh, how, how many how much of emissions are we related to space heating compared to all the other things in in our lives. So this is just a bit of work just to sort of try and get some sort of uh, order of magnitude on that. Right, so my last slide here before handing over to Gervais is really just bringing in some of the, the, the sort of uh, the bigger issues and it describes where the ACB is currently sort of uh, at, um, the, the questions we're sort of thinking about and struggling with to some extent. It's obvious we've got to uh, fully commit now to adapting to uh, the climate which has changed and will continue to change and also to ruggedize our infrastructure and our approaches because the climate uh, will be changing in ways that will make things uh, not necessarily immediately for our country so much, uh, but certainly it will be re reaching the UK, um, you know, sort of, uh, it'll become a, a more dangerous and, and sort of harsher, harsher world. Just come back from two weeks in Pakistan where they're really on the front, uh, front lines of this, uh, as I'm sure you've seen in the news. Um, we need to continue to dramatically cut emissions. So we just we just need to really up our game, up our game there. We need to pay attention to uh, material resources. Um, and part of that is changing the way we think about things. Um, and we need to be working together to sort of create a culture within these different industries, um, design and construction, uh, a culture of social and ecological respect. We've, we've written on this. So if you do get a chance to read uh, the sort of large, uh, larger technical essays we've written, um, uh, The Wood from the Trees, uh, we've sort of uh, done a shorter version of that called Placing Ecology at the Heart of Construction, which uh, if any of you are interested, you can find via the ACB website. We need to start realizing that um, the era of cheap energy is, is kind of over, but it doesn't necessarily, not a gloomy, terrible thing for, for, for creative uh, designers and problem solvers, but we should be thinking about things like avoiding building where possible. There may be other ways to satisfy briefs that don't require building at all. Um, we should obviously retrofit first, maintain uh, existing materials and not, not waste them. If we do build, Think about modesty and sufficiency. Do we really need things to be quite so big? Can we be more ingenious with our space planning? Buildings should be adaptable and components in those buildings should last a long time. We want to use materials that are envi as environmentally benign as possible, but sometimes uh, when you look at lifetime carbon modeling, some of these things can be a bit counterintuitive uh, and maybe things aren't quite as, as, as clear as just using a natural material um, for some uh, solutions. Uh, as I said, the weather is going to go a little bit, uh, is going, uh, is becoming more extreme in different ways, uh, in more intense rainfall, um, more intense hot, hot spells and um, heat waves and so on. And that also affects uh, the microclimates in and around buildings. So a good understanding of building science will keep you ahead of the curve in terms of uh, uh, designing and building robust climate resilient buildings. And uh, I think finish by saying do work to a standard, do work to building standards. Um, they are not, uh, th th they'll challenge your creativity, but they won't, uh, they won't put it in a box. Gervais, I'm very sorry that I've gone on for so long. Um, but I'm going to hand over to you. Okay, I'm unmuted. Hi. So yeah, I'm just going to quickly run through uh, a bit of a case study. Um, uh, just a quick background on what I do. Most of what I do is retrofit assessment. So I'm invited by clients to look at their property, usually something that they're living in uh, or have lived in for a while. Um, in this case, they just bought it actually. Look at how it is now <clears throat> and, um, and the options that they might have. Uh, loosely now based around those three or those two standards that Andy's just mentioned and um, an benefit, which I know you'll be you know, talking to somebody else about. So this is a place in um, North East London. Um, and in this slide here, you can see the estate agents plans there at the bottom and you can see the ground floor has got a, 
um, a built-in garage, which is outside the thermal envelope. And then to the left of that, there's some of the clients uh, who's an interior designer, some of the clients own plans for how they're going to remodel the floor and they're going to bring that garage into the thermal envelope. Um, and that introduces an idea that, that we wanted to um, highlight about form factor. Form factor is a, a way that we measure the kind of uh, how the characteristic of a building that, that tends to make it more or less lossy in terms of its heat. Uh, and generally we consider the best practice to be less than three of the form factor. And specifically what it is, is the entire surface area divided by what we call in, in Passive House, what we call the treated floor area. And that is um, what you can think of as the useful floor area. Uh, if you look at those two diagrams, either side of the, the central one at the top there, the, the yellow areas on those floor plans are the treated floor area. And actually you might be able to make out some little green areas those are sort of reduced areas of treated floor area because they're not that useful because the, the head height is low. And those areas that are gray are the, their staircases and, and they're considered to be outside of the TFA in, um, in, in the passive house methodology. The, um, the British regs and SAP does this in, in different ways and generally has a larger floor area. But yeah, form factor is the treated floor area divided into the entire surface area of the building. Passive house, that's the external area. So yeah, the one on the left there at the top there, you can see the garage is cut out. The one on the right um, is, is the sort of proposed change. And in the middle there, you can see the building centered, um, geolocated in its, in its orientation, which will allow us to have um, um, an assessment of the solar gains and, and those kind of gray blocks to sort of representing the buildings that might have an impact on, on the solar, so the, the effectively shading elements. And so we did a model of, I did a model of the, of the, of the building as it was found. Form factor is 3.2, so slightly outside that best practice. Uh, it's got 90 meters of treated floor area, very high space heat demand, 214 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. Um, peak, load, peak heat load of nine kilowatts. So that would be, that would need a heat, a heat pump of probably 10 or 11 kilowatt heat pump, which is which would be quite large for, a, for what is quite a modest sized building. The air tightness was, we did a little air test while I was there, much as I've done for your pavilion. It's a very, very leaky place. Uh, like visible, visible gaps down the windows and a, and a kind of timber ceiling, which was very leaky. Uh, the cavities hadn't been filled unusually. Um, and there was very little insulation in the loft. <clears throat> and the way that we model the heating is usually by an intermittent method. Normally, like, like most of you probably heat your homes, few hours in the morning, few hours in the evening, maybe a temperature on the thermostat of 21 degrees. And PHPP will tell you what the average temperature that would create in the home. And for this home, it would be about 16 degrees and it would use about 2000 pounds a year, current gas prices, just for the heating, not for hot water or not for anything else, just for heating. Next slide, please, Andy. Uh, the one before that. I think you did two there. Great, thanks. So, yeah. So, as I said, we do tend to do three scenarios. Um, the first one being the, the level one, the heat pump standard that, that, that um, Andy's highlighted there. And in this case, it would mean filling the cavities there are some solid wall bits on the front, which would have a little bit of EWI on them, replacing the windows with very standard, modern UPVC A-class windows, a, a decent amount of insulation in the loft, getting that air tightness down to about five, which is still kind of the notional best practice for SAP, but really in our world, a very quite an underwhelming air tightness target. And one we've chosen, I think Andy may have mentioned, because of recognizing the difficulties of, of getting to high levels of air tightness in, um, in light retrofits. The mechanical extract ventilation system, and all this can be heated with a modest amount of radiator. It's, it's halved the space heat demand with those measures. The peak load, heat load is now also pretty much halved. And so a five kilowatt heat pump being pretty much the smallest you can get uh, is possible. The average temperature has now gone up to 18 degrees under the same heating strategy. Uh, and, the, and the cost of electricity is only a thousand pounds to heat it. Um, go on to the next one. 
Uh, this, so this is the level two standard, the, the retrofit standard, the existing ACB retrofit standard. And here, you, you know, you can consider this a deep retrofit. Um, there were some, some considerations for the, for the client. They were not that keen on the idea of external wall insulation. So we looked at internal wall insulation on all walls, um, an air tightness of two, keeping with the MEV, triple glazed windows. They wanted to uh, dig the floor out for underfloor heating. Um, so we do get an insulated floor. It's not something that's always that easy to do. Um, reducing the thermal bridges, and I'll, I'll touch on that in a little bit. And the space heat demand there now modeled by PHPP, you can see is 39 kilowatt hours per meter square per annum, which is well below the 50 kilowatt hours target for the ACB uh, level two standard. Peak heat load is right down at two kilowatts now. And we've changed the heating strategy. What we find is once, once a, a house has been well insulated, uh, it becomes more efficient and more comfortable for people to allow themselves to heat their home 24 hours a day to 20 degrees. So actually this, redu this re very much reduced space heat demand is heating the house to a warmer temperature for more of the time. But yeah, you, you might notice if you look at the figures down the le left hand side that there is now a serious overheating risk. And that's due, uh, if you recall from the, the original slide of the picture of the building, they were changing a lot of glazing. It's an east west facing house, facing, facing house. And those, um, those large windows, particularly on the east side, um, have led to a significant amount of the, of the period of the year over 25 degrees. And, Obviously, for those living in cities after a summer that we've just gone through, that's something that we want to avoid in design at all costs, really, because that's only going to get worse. And the heating costs now have just dropped down to £400. So it's 20% of, um, uh, of, of what it would have been like in its current state and less than half of, of what it would cost um, under the level one. We could just quickly flick on, because uh, I, I do this for almost all clients, um, just quickly look at what it would like, what it would mean and what it would look like to, to take it to NFIT. Uh, so that would be a kind of an instead of, and it would be doing EWI on the cavity walls, introducing mechanical ventilation and heat recovery, putting in even better triple glazed windows, improving the air tightness down to the NFIT standard, which is, which is one air change per hour. Space heat demand is 21 kilowatt hours per meter squared, which is below the 25 kilowatt hour target for NFIT. Peak heat load is very small, and actually, the, the peak heat load now is about as small as the the minimum you can get out of a out of a five kilowatt heat pump, and that's at the coldest time. And there is, there is some sort of discussion around how difficult it is going to be to get heat pumps to run super efficiently in um, in very very highly insulated homes. Big big sort of discussion in the heat pump geek world, and it's just costing just two hundred and twenty five pounds a year to to heat this home. Move on. Uh, yeah, so it's just a, a few concepts that we wanted to kind of get across here. So that one of, of form factor is really crucial. Now, that, that house that we just looked at there is actually a, a very normal form factor. It's two stories. It's, it's, it's pretty much a cube. Um, when we get outside of normal form factor, it's things that are single story. So they, they only have one floor of floor area um, and maybe have quite a lot of surface area. So maybe high ceilings. So in the example of Wide Marsh Pavilion, uh, the large space in the middle of the building is, is very high ceilings, but there's only, only the, the, you know, the floor area is, is just a single floor. Um, and yeah, so adding extensions on, if you're going to add, add them on, then improving form factors should be something that you, you consider because we are, in order to get us to meet our standards, we are dividing our total amount of energy needed to heat by our floor area. And if our floor area is not increasing, but our uh, surface area is increasing, then we're gonna make it harder to hit those space heat demands. And it, it's not really just about hitting the, the standards. It, it's about those, those kind of efficiencies of resource that Andy was highlighting that we do as little building as possible um, and get as much useful floor area out of it. So I'd, you know, I'd be encouraging you to think about the the use of that large high ceiling space in the pavilion and see how you could get more floor area out of it without increasing the overall envelope area. Uh, and yeah, then the last thing today, like uh, Tabitha and I did an air test on Wide Marsh last week. And I think I'll be talking to you about air tightness 
next week but it's it's really key to design that in it just doesn't just happen by itself it really does need to be um uh it really needs to be thought about in every aspect of what you're doing to the to the envelope how how will any measures that you're doing be affected by or how will the airtightness be affected by the measures that you're implying how are you going to join the airtightness of one element to the airtightness of another element is that going to be easy to do is it possible it might look okay on the drawing table but is the builder who's going to do this going to be able to actually carry it out and and in retrofit it that is much much more challenging than it is in in new build you could push that on for me now Andy thanks that's um so that's a a picture of the internal thermal envelope of wide marsh pavilion there and um although it's you know it's it's you can't see the whole of the building it you can see how lumpy it is i, I suppose and you could see um that there's a lot of there's a lot of surface area given that the floor area is just on the on the underside of it and i, I did a quick calculation i would reckon the form factor is probably four and a half something like that so really quite bad in terms of form factor uh, and something that's going to make it particularly hard to achieve a stand to to achieve um, the, the acb standard i think that's yes i know i just added in here a couple of a couple of details here from from other projects um because in retrofit the other thing that it's harder to detail out than it is in new build is the thermal bridges and as we improve the uh thermal performance of the sort of the overall elements of the walls of the windows of the roof and of the floor the thermal bridges which is those those bits where those things join together um start to become a much more significant part of the overall heat loss and they can be the difference easily be the difference between achieving and not achieving a standard so um yeah kind of making sure that again whilst considering the air tightness where there are junctions trying to detail out easy to build thermal bridge free or at least low thermal bridge junctions is really really crucial uh, i think if you on the next slide there's an example this is there's a place so on the left is the kind of as built state um, is a kind of a, a cavity wall that wasn't particularly well filled and the loft insulation would have been in that kind of triangular shape on the on the left hand drawing and you can see that there's a kind of there's a huge gap between the top of the cavity insulation and where the loft insulation would be in in how the building was originally built uh, and on the right is the detail that we came up with for dealing with that and um although it was quite complicated uh, to do uh, it does mean that that corner detail now does have a bit of insulation bar the rafters there's a bit of insulation that wraps all the way around and joins the loft insulation to the wall insulation and I, I suspect that's all I really have time for. Thanks, Gervais. That was great. Yeah, thank you, gentlemen. We have um, a few questions you've been answering, so I've got two to answer live, and I'll just see with you two, like almost like one sentence <laughs> each on them. So, what type of insulation um, would you suggest to fill a cavity with? Well, there's quite limited options for cavity wall insulation. It depends on the exposure of the wall and it also depends on the type of mortar there so some 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 walls are in worse condition and you might choose a, an insulation material because in fact you don't as a designer you don't have a lot of choice here you 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 depend on what's available and what the installer is prepared to do and by the guarantees so unfortunately we're talking about polystyrene bead which is now graphitized so it's the gray polystyrene bead um in, i think they're probably still doing gervais so they've blown mineral fiber yep insulation. it's about the places in london that will only do that because of fire, fire risk fire risk okay and then um you can still you can get um sprayed injected uh, polyurethane insulation for high performance um there are questions you have to you do have to be careful about um, the sort of mortar snots that have fallen on the on the on the wall ties, which can transmit moisture. When that cavity is empty, it can it can dry out. When it's filled, you might potentially get spots of moisture coming across to the wall unless you weatherize the outside of the wall. So, really, it's paying attention to moisture, um, but you don't have a lot of choice. Perfect. So basically, no natural insulation really within the cavity wall, well, just because well, of the 
well, moisture? I think probably not, certainly not down the base of the wall where it's a bit potentially moisture risk, but we have, um, when we put in uh, cellulose insulation in attics and the insulation mm. hasn't been sort of properly filled in at the top of a cavity wall, we have mm. allowed the cellulose insulation to go down into that where we have also added external wall insulation on the outside of it. So we've weatherized the wall mm -hmm. at the top and we're a bit more relaxed there about putting um, mm -hmm. cellulose insulation or granulated cork. It's really about what you can get hold of and what's what's cost effective, as in what's affordable. So, yeah, not <laughs> a lot of choice. And thank you. That leads directly on to our last question. Um, everybody wants to know costs. Have you done any cost calculations? Is there anywhere that um, our participants can access them on the AECB website or? <laughs> Well, there, there is a lot of cost information. The problem is this, that it's not, it's not presented in a standardised way and there is very hard to find the time and, uh, and or funding to share this information. So it, it, it's, it's, it's a shame. The only thing I'd say about cost information is it can be very project specific, it can be very regional specific, it can be very year specific because of the ups and downs of, of mm -hmm. cost. So we, we tend to work on basic principles. Um, for the project, you can see bottom right there, that was a, an over cladding system using an I-beam system, which is what we built for you down at, uh, at the MMI workshops. Mm -hmm. um, and we did do a costing exercise and it looked to be about broadly similar cost to put timber I-beams and 300 millimetres of cellulose insulation for the similar cost, same U value, as putting a polystyrene uh, direct rendered system on there. Broadly, yeah. broadly speaking, mm -hmm. okay. Um, and there is information there, but we simply don't have the resources to share it in a standardised format. It's a good question and it is frustrating, but no, we're not there yet at all with, with, uh, with um, low carbon construction building costs, no. Yeah, no, oh, brilliant. Thank you both. And I'm going to um, close the questions and go back to sharing screen. And yeah, I want to go to that one. So a huge thank you, Patrish, I know she was in the background, and Andy and Gervais for sharing their hard-earned knowledge, because I know they've both been into their own deep retrofits, and I sympathise entirely, but it's the way you, you learn, which is why, again, why we've brought this um, challenge together, and we'd um, you know, encourage more of you to come and get involved. So it is the Wide Marsh Pavilion, and as Gervais said, we were out there a week or so ago doing an air tightness test and looking at the fabric of the building, and uh, uh, Gervais will be back next week to, to give some more information um, along with um, Beth and Flora. Flora. Um, so you've got Google Street View, again, Google Earth, and we're looking at the triangle of land that the building sits on. Um, so again, how do you increase um, biodiversity and actually use the planting scheme to maybe help sort of alleviate sort of overheating and, you know, the potential for absorbing more water. But you can't go beyond the frontage of the building. That doesn't mean you can't enclose with a glass screen on, um, it's probably the northeast side of the building. So again, you might not have too many overheating risks there. You can extend um, up to half a metre either side, which is, you know, when you might be looking at external wall insulation, and then you can um, extend to the rear. But remember what Andy said again, it's about sufficiency and what Gervais said about it's um, looking at your footprint and how many floors you can get within that space, and that will give you your best <laughs> results. Um, where am I going here? Um, so come and join us next week. We'll get more into detailing for Timber Frame. We'll then be starting to team form. So again, we've got ask individuals from all UK universities to come and sign up and we will help you form a team. It doesn't mean that you can't bring your friends along. But again, we'd recommend you don't have too many architects in your team. You know, you want to balance between architects <laughs> and engineers and landscape architects. And Andy's laughing at me. <laughs> yes, uh, so and obviously cost consultants. You want a interdisciplinary team that will give you the you'll learn so much from it and you'll learn how to talk all the other disciplines languages and I know tonight we're up against the football I have no idea what's happening outside there so for all those people who missed it we do do the recordings and they, we put them on our YouTube channel um, 
And this is where we work. So all these three softwares were mentioned by Andy and Gervais. We will bring you workshops along with often the developers of these um, this software. So Design PH and PHPP, the Trimble SketchUp and the AECB Carbon Calculator, which is likely to be the PH ribbon version. So uh, after this challenge, you will be fully conversant with software that works together, which will take you a long way in your career. Where do you find all the information on the challenges? It's on the Timber Development UK website. And so I don't think I introduced myself at the beginning. I'm Tabitha Binding. I lead on education and engagement. And Timber Development UK is the um, amalgamation of TRADA and the Timber Trade Federation. Brand new website, go to education. That's where you'll find all the information on this current challenge and our past two challenges. And as I said, if you missed our recordings, this is where you'll go and find them. Look for the Timber Development UK University Design Challenge um, YouTube channel. And with that all, I would like to say good night and come and join us next week. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck, everyone. <laughs>